Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today titled Fast and Reliable Surface Area Gas Analysis with the new SA9650 Analyzer. My name is Brent Cunningham from Hariba, and I'm your facilitator. We'll also have some time at the end for a Q&A session. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, John Guerin. John has been involved in the particle characterization industry for more than 30 years. He has worked with all forms of gas absorption instrumentation, and having joined Hariba as product manager for the gas absorption product line, he brings his vast experience to support our ever-expanding customer base. So with Thank that, you. I would I will pass the ball to you, John. Um, all right. Please share your screen whenever you're ready. Thank you all for uh, coming. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hopefully not good night. Uh, <laughs> Uh, welcome to you all, and thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Um, certainly my endeavor that this presentation is going to be both enjoyable and informative for you. So with that, let's get started. The introduction to the new Hariba SA9650 Dynamic Surface Area Analyzer. So before we get to the instrument, I want to make sure we're all kind of operating from the same foundation. So let's review a few things that might be important to our discussion here today. Gas adsorption, um, what we're obviously talking about here today, the buildup of gas molecules on the surface of a solid, and it's a reversible process, which is known as desorption. What drives it is uh, van der Waals forces, which are unmet uh, energy on the surface of a material. Within the solid itself, uh, molecules adjoining one another satisfy that uh, those van der Waals forces. But at the interface of that material to water or uh, gas, those forces are unsatisfied and thus uh, in nature they adsorb water or other vapors. In order to prepare a sample or what we call degassing a sample in gas adsorption, we have to heat the sample while flowing gas over the sample powder bed in a sample holder. And this removes naturally occurring adsorbates from the surface of the material, enabling us to adsorb gas molecules onto the surface during the test. The analysis itself typically utilizes cryogenic temperatures and most frequently liquid nitrogen in a uh, cryogenic doer. And the sample is exposed to a single or multiple pressures or alternatively gas concentrations to determine the adsorption data. So the adsorption data, the raw data is called an isotherm and it's from a test at con constant temperature, um, again with liquid nitrogen, typically 77.3 Kelvin, and it's plotted as volume of gas adsorbed on the y-axis versus pressure on the x-axis. A little bit more about the pressure is important here. Saturation pressure is the pressure of a gas which is in equilibrium with its liquid, expressed as P0 or P sub zero. In the case of nitrogen and liquid nitrogen, we would have a doer filled with liquid nitrogen, we would have an empty sample tube, and we would uh, put gas into that tube until it reached its maximum pressure or saturation pressure. Alternatively, this can be calculated quite easily from ambient pressure. Relative pressure is a means to normalize data that are collected in labs at different atmospheric conditions. So a laboratory in California near the coast, one in Denver at very high elevation, one in Tokyo, um, we might have various atmospheric conditions that are present even in the standard atmospheric conditions. And of course, as we all know, we have low pressure systems and high pressure systems that come through any locale, and that changes the atmospheric pressure. So as a way to normalize this, we take the absolute pressure and divide it by the saturation pressure. And again, the saturation pressure is affected by the local atmospheric pressure. And that ratio is typically expressed as an integer or a percent so 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, et cetera, or 5%, 10%, 20%, so on and so forth. So again, the isotherm is the raw data. 
uh, plotted um, with the volume of gas on the y-axis and the partial pressure of gas concentration on the x-axis. And when we talk about that, we talk about the x-axis actually spanning from zero to one. So from relative pressure of zero to relative pressure of one, which means the absolute pressure is the same as the saturation pressure at that point. Surface area is calculated from a linear area, a linear region of the isotherm, which is created as multiple layers of gas build up on the surface. So typically, and there are many different shapes to isotherms, um, dependent on the pore structure of the materials, but just as a representative run of the mill isotherm, typically we initially have buildup of gas on the surface of the material, and then we start building layer upon layer. So we end up with a linear region in the isotherm, as you see here. And then beyond that, depending on the pore structure, we might have substantial gas adsorption as we're filling pores with gas um, in the case of uh, mesopores or at higher pressures in the case of macropores. But nonetheless, we're no longer building up layer upon layer on the surface. We're filling pores at this point. So the most typical model to measure surface area utilizes the BET method. And this was uh, first postulated by three fellows, Brunauer, Emmett, and Teller, Teller of atomic bomb fame, as a matter of fact, in 1938. Um, inter interestingly enough, they came together only for a brief period of time and came up with uh, this model, this theory, and uh, from what I have been told, it is still one of the most frequently quoted uh, papers in all scientific literature. So data are collected in this linear region, which typically, again, thinking of our x-axis as fractions of from zero to one, uh, from 0.05 to 0.3, or 5% to 30% gas concentration. And again, pressure is normalized by using the saturation pressure, or P0, as the maximum pressure. So BET calculation, the equation in linear form looks like this. We have as the Y value, pressure, saturation pressure, and volume adsorbed. All values we are measuring or calculating. And then as the X axis, we have saturation pressure or relative pressure here. So volume of gas adsorbed, absolute pressure, saturation pressure, what our goal is to calculate the monolayer volume of gas on the surface of the material. And you see that term here in the uh, slope and here in the y-intercept. And then also we calculate from this what is called the BET constant, or BETC constant, which is an expression that's related to the heat of adsorption. The, typically, the higher that value is, the more energetic the adsorption is on the surface of the material. So if we take this um, linear equation and we plot the Y value versus the uh, relative pressure on the X value, and then have more than one data point, we can pr pr produce a linear regression through those data points and measure the slope of that line and the Y intercept of that line. The slope, is equal to C minus one over V sub MC, and the intercept is equal to one over V sub MC. Thus, by using this, I can determine the volume monolayer V sub M by calculating one over the slope plus the intercept of our regression analysis. And the C value is equal to one plus the slope divided by the intercept. So when I have this monolayer volume, Obviously, my goal is to calculate the surface area, uh, BET surface area of the material. So in order to do that, I plug in the monolayer volume to this, va to this equation, multiply it times Avogadro's number and times the cross-sectional area of a gas molecule. And again, in our typical case, we're talking about nitrogen, which has a cross-sectional area of 0.162 square nan nanometers, and then divide that by the molar volume. And this gives us the surface area under test, so the amount of surface area in the sample tube. What we really need to know is the specific surface area in meters squared per gram. So we take this total surface area under test divided by the sample mass, 
which gives us the surface area meter squared per gram. So it's very simplistic, but if I had 100 square meters in the sample tube uh, by this calculation, and I had 10 grams of sample, I'd have 10 meters squared per gram of material. So you may have heard of single point calculation from the BET equation. How is it done? Well, when the C value is very large, this heat of adsorption, then one divided by V sub MC approaches zero. C becomes very large. One divided by a huge number is practically zero. What does this mean? Well, it means that the Y intercept is very close to zero. Thus, we can perform our regression analysis by forcing one point through the origin without substantial area in the surface area result as a result of a potential change to the slope. Likewise, when C is very large, C minus one is almost C. So C minus one divided by V sub M C becomes one over V sub M, which simplifies our equation to the y-axis value, the x-axis value, and the only unknown, the monolayer volume. So single point versus multipoint, how, how do they compare? Well, single point's much faster than multipoint data collection. It's pretty obvious, I guess. You collect one data point versus three or five or 20. Depending on the material, single point and multipoint may be very close to one another. Maybe very little difference in the results that are obtained from a single point analysis versus a multi-point analysis. Multi-point's typically more accurate because it's not making any assumptions uh, about a large C value, meaning an accurate y-intercept for the regression al analysis is being used versus the use of the origin. However, a single point is maybe not as accurate sometimes, but it's always very repeatable and reproducible. So thus in a production environment or where quick material screening is required, single point provides a great advantage and does provide very useful results. So on to the instruments a little bit, I guess. Um, one of the things that people may not be aware of is Ariba has been involved in gas adsorption for many years. Um, starting out with the history of this instrument, which the new instruments built on a very robust and long proven platform. This instrument was originally developed in the early 1990s by a fellow by the name of Howard Jennings, who had a company named Beta Scientific. It was then known as the SA6200. Beta Scientific distributed it throughout Europe uh, through Thermo Finnegan. And this is actually an image of one of the instruments Thermo Finnegan packaged and sold at that time. Hariba Instruments originally agreed to distribute the instrument in 1995. And then Hariba purchased the product from Beta Scientific in 2005. So in practically 20 years of ownership, we've made a number of improvements to what was then called the 9600 and still is to this day. And we've gotten up to the most recent version three. And during that time, there have been changes in software, hardware and electronics. But for the most part, the look of the instrument hasn't changed very much over that time. So we're talking about dynamic adsorption. One final little definition here in discussion. You know, maybe you've heard of dynamic and volumetric, but let's contrast them just a little bit. So dynamic adsorption uses the flowing gas mixture over the sample. The adsorption is determined differentially using thermal conductivity detectors. So I have a gas mixture that flows into the instrument flows through a thermal conductivity detector, which based on the conductivity of the gas, uh, measures a certain voltage. The gas then flows into the sample tube and over the sample bed, which in the case of an adsorption experiment is now immersed in liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen adsorbs onto the surface of the material. And as the gas exits the sample tube, it passes through a second thermal conductivity detector. The gas mixture now is depleted of some or most of the nitrogen and thus has a different thermal conductivity measured by the TCD. So the TCD on the inlet compared to the TCD on the outlet produces a differential voltage that allows us to determine the volume of gas adsorbed. This dynamic method is extremely fast. 
for data collection and doesn't require any volume calibration of a manifold or sample tube. It's extremely simple, elegantly simple, as I say there, and it's very robust and reliable. This translates into the fact that the instrument is a much lower cost to purchase, much lower cost to maintain, and it's just, again, great for high throughput screening or for production, quality assurance, quality control environments. And you can measure single point or multi-point BET surface area with a dynamic instrument. Now, volumetric instruments, on the other hand, dose gas from a calibrated manifold. So the adsorption that is made on the surface of the material is determined through recording of a calibrated manifold and a measured volume of a sample holder, and then the pressure change that results as we fill the manifold with gas, let it equilibrate, open a valve, let gas flow onto the sample, and let that equilibrate. So this is typically a slower data collection process. Um, for any single data point, that example that I just gave you of filling the manifold and then dosing onto the sample, might have to be repeated 10, 15, 20 times to reach a single data point. So that's why volumetric typically is much slower. The volume of the manifold uh, calibration is required. That's typically done in manufacturing or by a service person. And then the volume of the sample tube, uh, not displaced by sample, needs to be measured at the outset of each test. And there are alternatives to this where one calibrates sample tubes by measuring their empty volume, keeps that recorded in a table, and then recalls that for application when they are selecting sample tube X and applies that volume. But that also requires that you have to know the true density of the sample so that the true volume of sample in the sample tube can be calculated and subtracted from that sample tube volume. Typically, these instruments are much more complex design. They have multiple valves. They have vacuum systems and multiple transducers, which means they're typically higher cost to purchase and also higher cost to maintain. But to their credit, they're more appropriate for research and pore size distribution measurements in particular. So real briefly, what do we do when we're creating an analysis, creating a sample, uh, performing an analysis on the instrument? We take the U-shaped sample tubes, examples as you see here, and determine the empty tear weight of the tube. Then we put sample into the sample tube using the funnel that's provided. Next, we put the sample tube onto a sample tube holder. And you see that here uh, from two different angles. The sample tube's now been mounted into the sample tube holder. And one of the very nice things about this holder um, that is provided along with the dynamic system is that these holders are self-sealing. So Right now, that sample tube is not open to atmosphere. When the sample tube is mounted on the instrument, these bulkhead fittings open and allow access for gas to flow through the sample tube. When it's removed from the instrument, they're sealed again, and the sample tube cannot be contaminated, which is important for gas adsorption experiments. In volumetric systems, for the most part, you're dealing with a tube with a stopper. You've got to remove the stopper, put it on degas, remove it from degas, stop it, remove the stopper, put it on analysis. Um, it's frequently open to atmosphere as you're handling it. So with the sample tube in the holder, it's installed onto the degas or preparation station, and then a heating mantle is placed around the sample tube. And the we start the degas process with the controller a, by determining a temperature and time for the degas process. When the degassing is complete, we transfer the sample tube to the um, analysis station or test station and initiate the analysis. When the analysis is initiated after an automatic gas calibration, the doers of LN2 are then automatically raised, as you see here, and the adsorption process begins. So that brings us to the introduction of the new SA9650. With all that background now, we're all on the same page. So it's my pleasure to show this instrument to you. It is a new modern design. We have, uh, the instrument is now CE uh, marked, so it's available globally. We have new safety covers to protect users 
covering the degas portion of the instrument with a latch, as well as the analysis portion of the instrument with a latch. As opposed to the older models, the 9600, no side access is required. In the 9600, the front of the instrument does analysis and the side of the instrument was where you mounted the degas samples. So none of that is required. And all models, as opposed to the old 9600, are built with three preparation stations. And we have new PC-based software to control the instrument that can run on any Windows platform, 10, 11, what have you. So everything you need is in one small package here. We have an onboard controller that has a keyboard and LCD display, and you have the ability to use that or connect a PC to the instrument and run it from a PC with, again, the Windows software. Easily accessible degas, again, the degas system here, the door opens, hinged here on the left, and the analysis system with three, in this case, three sample uh, ports hinged here on the right, opened from this direction. There are four models to choose from. The SA9651 SP is a single analysis station and produces single point BET. The SA9653 SP has three analysis stations and produces single point BET. The SA9651 MP has a single analysis station, but can produce single point or multi-point BET measurements. And the SA9653 MP, three analysis stations and either single or multi-point measurements. And again, all configurations include three prep stations. So for the one SP and the one MP, what you would see different in this image is there would be no sample tube mounting point and doer on the left or the right. There would just be a single doer in the center. In terms of the software, some of the improvements have been made to the much more easily accessible uh, working with the prep stations. Sample files can be created and loaded or method files created to be used for a variety of different samples. Or one can simply type in a temperature and a time and start the degas process. True for all three stations, they can be independently controlled, different temperatures, different analysis protocols, different times. Also, we've added a plot that shows you the profile of time versus temperature for each preparation station. And the analysis stations on that uh, the measure station screen, a lot of information again available to the user about the sample loaded on each measure station, the sample ID, uh, if it's got a method, again, which is a reusable uh, standard operating procedure that can be applied to many different samples, the file name and sample weight and so on and so forth. Also on the left-hand side, we see an operational status that tells you step-by-step step what is happening as the analysis progresses. Once samples are loaded physically on the instrument and sample files are loaded on the uh, measure station ports here, it's a very simple process to click the start button and the analysis has begun. Here are the signals from the TCD, and this is representative of a three-point multi-point uh, BET analysis where the gas flows and there is uh, no difference in voltage. An injection for calibration is performed and that causes this peak. The doers are then raised and we see adsorption occurring. The adsorption process ends, the doers lowered and desorption occurs. Then desorption ends, gas concentration changes, another calibration injection, another adsorption and desorption cycle, gas concentration changes a third time, an injection for calibration, adsorption, desorption, the signal returns to zero, the analysis is complete. So a lot of information available on the screen, very intuitive, very easy to access and very easy to operate. And in results view is a new addition. You can have as many sample files as you'd like available here on the left panel. You select those files and they're displayed here where you see the sample information, surface area and whatnot. Um, you have a selected file 
that is then displayed below sample information, analysis information, and results information. And in the case of this multi point, uh, three point analysis, we see a BET plot and the raw data from that BET plot. I can select multiple files and then it will automatically average the results and give me coefficient of variation. I can also select multiple files and generate overlay plots. I can print analyses, I can generate PDFs, I can export files to Excel or as text files. This is an example of uh, a PDF report for a three-point multi-point surface area measurement. And finally, these are just uh, showing some results from three different aliquots of a commercially available calcium carbonate, analyzed three times each for a single point analysis as well as multi-point analysis. So uh, three different samples, three different aliquots, repeated three times, the average within each sample tube, and then the average of all nine tests here with coefficient of variation and standard deviation. Single point, and then the same for the multi-point on this calcium carbonate. Total of nine tests, three tubes, three tests each. And then here are three aliquots of commercially available kaolin that were analyzed similarly. Three tests each, three samples each, single point and multi-point. Finally, just a table to show you a variety of materials. And for most of these, we have application notes available that show you the single point and multi-point values. And as you can see quite readily from looking at this, there's not a tr tremendous difference. While again, multi-point may ultimately be more accurate, the offset between single point and multi-point is going to be consistent. And so you can perform a correlation study between single point and multi-point so that you can utilize single point whenever you'd like. So um, in summary, the new SA9650 is built on a reliable time proven platform that's been around for 40 years. It has rugged performance. The cost to purchase the instrument is extremely low and the cost of ownership is also very low. And it's probably the smallest footprint per analysis port available. Um, when you talk about having everything you need in one cabinet to perform analyses. It can be operated standalone or from a PC. And finally, it's backed by Hariba's global reputation for quality, support, and service. So with that, I will um, stop talking for a minute and see if uh, questions have come in to Brent while I've been rattling on. Uh, at the bottom, though, you'll see my contact information, as well as an email address for you to use for uh, general information, or if you'd like to just request information from Hariba about this uh, webinar separate from uh, email and me, either one is fine. So feel free to utilize those. Great. Thanks, John. We do have some time for Q&A. So the first question to come in is what if there is a large difference between single point and multi-point results? Typically, that would indicate, again, um, a lower C value, a lower heat of adsorption. So one may say, well, I need a more accurate result. Well, that is certainly true if you're providing a certificate of analysis or publishing a number that uh, a, a customer may be using. Um, However, again, single point is very repeatable. So if I have a single point value of 160 and a multipoint value of 178, uh, that offset should be quite consistent across my tests of this material. So it's, it's quite simple to generate a correlation study on the one hand. On the other hand, Again, single point could be utilized simply in a production environment. And when you needed to produce final results, you could use our instrument to produce a multi-point result and um, use that for your certificate of analysis. Great, thanks, John. We did have another question come in from Anna. Uh, she asks, what can cause a material to have a negative C value even when material is thoroughly degassed? Um, so that's typically not related to degassing. That's that's a good question too. 
um, a lot of times people will report BET results with uh, a negative y-intercept. Um, if you've got a negative c-value, you've got a negative y-intercept. And um, that essentially means that the data points you're using for reporting your BET surface area are not appropriate for that material. Um, an example of that might be a high surface area material that uh, actually is better suited to collecting data at lower pressures because the uh, pores of a high surface area material are typically microporous. They um, adsorb at very low pressures. So measuring BET surface area is best restricted to lower pressures. And so typically if you were to, the, the typical range say from 0.05 to 0.3 for most materials, for microporous, microporous material, you might be collecting data from uh, 0.05 to 0.1, for example, um, to to eliminate that problem with a negative y-intercept. Okay, great. Thank you, John. We have another from Brittany. She asks, how much more accurate is the SA versus using a surface area calculation on a particle size analyzer? That's also a good question. Well, when you're measuring uh, particle size, uh, depending on your technique, almost every technique makes a lot of assumptions about the shape, um, spherical or equivalent spherical or cross-sectional area of a circle, but none of them take into account surface roughness or porosity. So you're making a simple calculation for surface area of a material from particle size, assuming a perfect sphere or perfect circle with no porosity or surface roughness whatsoever. So it's um, probably not best to hang your hat on a surface area measurement or surface area calculation rather from a particle size measurement because you are definitely, uh, unless you have perfect non-porous smooth spheres, you're going to have a substantial error in your surface area calculation from a true surface area measurement. Okay, thanks for that. Another one that we have, uh, when I degas a sample, how do I know what temperature to use? So um, typically degassing a sample, you want to avoid changing the structure of the material whatsoever. And you wanna be able to have a temperature that if you degassed it for an hour or two and it's totally degassed, that's fine. And if you ended up leaving it degassing overnight, it wouldn't change the structure of the material. So if you have no idea, um, one of the best rules of thumb to start with is to see if you can determine the textbook melting point for the material or um, maybe the lowest melting point for a compounded material. And then typically select about 50% of that temperature as your maximum degas temperature. I mean, at the end of the day, you're trying to drive off mostly water vapor. So if you have a temperature above 100 degrees C, you're ultimately going to do that. You may just do it more slowly than if you were doing it at 200, 250, or 300 degrees C. When working with pharmaceutical powders, those typically are not as uh, forgiving of higher temperatures. And so you may have to work at much lower temperatures, 35 or 50 degrees C for a much longer period of time to drive off any adsorbed uh, water on the surface of those materials. Okay, the next question, how is the gas concentration produced for a single point and multi-point analysis? So um, in the multi-point instrument, there are mass flow controllers. So the two versions of the 9650 that are multi-point instruments, there are two mass flow controllers that mix the gas so that you can designate a 5%, 10%, 15, 20, 25, 30, so on and so forth, percent mixture of gas. And this is what allows you to apply a 30% nitrogen, 70% helium mixture, which is typically what is used for a single point for most uh, typical materials, uh, as well as the different mixtures for a multipoint. In the single point version of the instruments, there are no mass flow controllers. 
and you are connecting a pre-mixed gas cylinder, uh, again, which is typically 30% nitrogen, 70% helium, and that mixture then just flows over the surface of the material. Uh, a separate tank of nitrogen is connected so that it can do the injection for calibration, and uh, but there is no mixing of gas for the single point instrument. Okay, we do have just a couple of more questions here. Um, can I use the software at my desk to manage reports? Yeah, that's a that's a nice feature. Um, I don't know how the, a lot of companies that do this, but Hariba makes the software available. Once you have the instrument and the software, you can load the software on a computer at your office or desktop uh, away from the instrument. And you can transfer files and have the ability to, you know, weigh the samples, put in sample weights, final sample weights, and um, generate reports, generate overlays, um, you know, uh, manipulate the data in any way you'd like. Um, so that's a very nice feature to be able to get away from the lab and sit down at your desk and work with the data uh, for generating final reports or uh, final calculations. Okay, thank you. Lastly, how do I determine the sample mass? You know, um, that's a good question. I didn't really mention that. I kind of glossed over it. So I said when we begin, we determine the tear weight of the sample tube, and then we put sample into the sample tube. And that sample's not been prepared yet, so it still has water vapor on the surface. So we're really not as interested in the mass of the sample at that point. However, a lot of times folks like to weigh that um, so that they can determine the amount of loss after the sample's been prepared. But either way, whether you record the mass of the sample prior to degassing or not, the important piece is to have the empty sample tube weight. The sample's degassed, and so that we don't expose it to atmosphere, we go ahead and take it from degass and put it onto the analysis port and perform the analysis. When the analysis is complete, it's only then that we remove the sample tube from the sample tube holder and weigh the sample tube and degassed sample, which now shouldn't have any real adsorption on the surface, and use that mass, subtract the tear weight of the sample tube, and that is the mass of the final uh, sample that we're testing. That's, I'm glad that was asked because I didn't mention that in the talk, and I certainly that's an important piece of the measurement of any gas adsorption in instrument. All right, thanks for your expertise on that, John. Um, that was the last question that we have. Uh, however, I do want to say, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, if you do have any questions or need feedback, um, you can reach out to John at john.garin at hariba.com or for more general information, labinfo at hariba.com. But on behalf of our particle group, thank you so much for attending. We'll see you at the next webinar. We do have a few webinars coming up later on in May and June. So please be on the lookout for those. You can sign up for a newsletter by answering yes in the post webinar survey, or you can follow us on LinkedIn at the Hariba Particle Characterization Group. So with that, again, thank you, John. And thank you. Thank everyone for attending. I very much enjoyed being able to spend time with you. I hope you found it helpful. All right, great. See everyone next time. Bye for now.